get Grotenesis um, and for how it came to be. So in order for you to understand that, I think it'd be helpful for me to share my journey. So my name is Lindsay Huey. I grew up playing soccer in Southern California. Um, I played from probably the time that I was four until about two years ago. Um, so when I was younger, I played at the rec level for quite a few years. And then about 10, I joined a club team. Um, and at 11, I joined the Southern California Blues. I was there for about five or six years and then left to San Diego Surf for my last year where we were national champions. Um, and then around U18, which would have been probably my senior year of high school, I finally got that big call up to the youth uh, US national team. And so I thought this was gonna be my big break. I thought all those years of practice and hard work and dedication, sweat and tears um, was really going to be, you know, my big, big calling. So I got called up about three days before the camp started, which is not typical. Um, somebody had gotten injured, which of course I had no idea. And so they were looking for an extra player to go. Well, uh, it was in Virginia. So you go obviously by yourself, no parents. And uh, when I get to camp, I quickly realize like that there's this division. Coach calls over all of the starters and then all of the subs. And so that's basically how camp went for about two weeks. Um, there was not a lot of cross transferring of players. The head coach worked primarily just with the starters and then the assistant coach worked with the subs. Uh, the coach and I had very little interaction. And so at the very end of camp, you have what's called an exit interview. And so you and the coach sit face to face and this is where they give you your feedback um, from the you know 10 days or two weeks, however long camp was. And so here I sit with the head coach for the first time, I feel like we're looking at each other eye to eye. And um, he says, you know, thank you so much for coming to camp. Um, you're not good enough to play at this level. And that was the exit interview. Unlike most players, I did not cry. And I really walked away from the meeting thinking, you know, I really wish he would have given me some solid feedback that he would have watched me play and given me feedback about maybe my first touch or my speed of play or holding onto the ball too long or something of substance so I could go back and work on things. Um, but the feedback that he gave me was brief, very to the point. Um, and in my opinion, really inaccurate. Had he watched me play and then given me feedback, I think that I would have taken it for what it was. Um, but because he never saw me play the entire time that I was there, you know, I walked away thinking, you know what, I'm just gonna keep working on my game and then, you know, I'll be back. So I committed to the University of Portland with Clive Charles, um, sight unseen, which I don't recommend. Um, but that was the way that my journey went. I allowed my club coach to help me through the process. And so I felt very confident picking the school without even having seen it. And so on the first day that you could make contact was the day that I verbally committed to Portland, no regrets. Um, just because I don't advise other people not to do it in the way that I did it doesn't mean I didn't totally enjoy my entire journey and how it came to be. So I committed to the University of Portland and um, had a couple of setbacks. I'd had knee surgery going in to my freshman year, which I recovered pretty well from and was ready to go. And then my freshman year, I wound up uh, tearing my meniscus, I believe it was. Um, and so I had to redshirt that freshman year, which of course was disappointing because I anticipated that I would be playing my freshman year. Um, and sitting out and watching the team play was hard, but it was also one of the best things that ever happened in my career as I was able to visually process um, a lot of the game in a way that I wouldn't have been able to um, if I hadn't obviously had incurred that injury. So um, I remember feeling very homesick because as a redshirt freshman, the team travels, but you don't. And so that was the hardest part was keeping myself motivated during that time where the team was connecting and they were gone and I was at home. 
you know, I remember looking out my window after surgery and I couldn't run um, and I could barely walk. And I just really felt uh, a lot of jealousy watching people be able to run and walk so freely and thinking, oh my gosh, I have to relearn all of, you know, walking and running. And it was, and it, meniscus is a small surgery. That's not like an ACL. So um, I had a lot of frustration, but, you know, I stayed very disciplined and um, checked in with a lot of people I felt like I was connected to on the team. And of course our coach helped me to stay motivated. And so um, uh, my red shirt freshman year, which obviously wasn't my true freshman year, it was 2002, uh, we wound up making a great run and advanced to the you know NCAA D1 National Championship. And so I started and we played and we won. And it was the first time in history that the University of Portland had ever won a national championship. And so obviously there was a lot of TV exposure and whatnot. It was significant for so many reasons. That year we learned that our head coach, Clive Charles, was um, sick from prostate cancer and that that would be the last competitive game that he would ever coach. Um, and obviously the only one that he'd ever win because he wound up passing away the next summer, which was devastating to my soccer career. It was a really, really tough time for me in figuring out whether or not I was gonna continue to play, um, whether or not I was gonna stay at the school. I mean, it was definitely the most difficult moment probably of my soccer career. Um, but obviously also having won a national championship as a freshman was, you know, one of the best moments of my career. So um, after winning, I get a call up to the U21 national team. And this time I decided that I was really gonna change my mindset. That this time when I got called up, I was gonna make darn sure that the coach knew who I was, uh, intermixed me with the starters, and then I got a real chance to show what I could or couldn't do. And so I made a point every day to say hi to the coach um, multiple times a day. I made uh, fast friends with a couple of starters on the team. And you know, I have to say that had I not done that, I honestly don't think my journey would have been any different as a player. But because I mentally approached the game in a different way and I took kind of it off the field and into a different um, dynamic, it helped my ability to make and stay on the team. I was on that team for about five years, played alongside Carly Lloyd and Leslie Osborne and uh, Ashlyn Harris and Allie Krieger. I mean, Becky Sauron. There's a lot of players on that team that are on the fall women's team now. And so by making that little adjustment mentally, I was able to make a huge impact in my game. Um, and so in my career in 2005, we wound up at another NCAA championship against UCLA in the finals. And I mean, gosh, the team was stacked. It was Christine Sinclair and Megan Rapino, Angie Wozniak, Stephanie Lopez, um, the team had so many superstars and then a lot of players who just knew how to show up and get the job done and um, were all about the team. And so we wound up winning another national championship, which was amazing. We were, I think, only the second team in history to go undefeated an entire season. Um, and so obviously there was not a ton of obstacles during that season, except that you have this young superstar coming onto the team and kind of, you know, finagling themselves into your spot. So I faced, you know, um, the adversity of having to play a different position that I wasn't quite comfortable in, didn't quite love, um, but it was best for the team and I knew that. And so I always put the team first and as much as it was an internal struggle to not be central for the team, um, it was certainly central to the team's success that, you know, we all kind of change um, positions, roles, and everything to accommodate, you know, um, Megan Rapino and Christine Sinclair um, and their roles on the team as well. So, you know, it's always interesting for me when players uh, 
say that they only play one spot or one position or they're most comfortable there or they hate playing somewhere. You know, on that team that year, a lot of sacrifices had to be made and it was always in the best interest of the team. And so I always felt um, good about that, even though, of course, there was a personal, you know, um, sting in that you lose your spot sometimes. Yes, you do. And when it's Megan Rapino, you step out of the way and you do it with a smile on your face. So, um, you know, that was my collegiate career. And I won't say that I didn't have additional obstacles because I did. I feel like I was the queen of having many obstacles. Uh, during the time that I had left high school and gone to college, I found out that I had something called Graves' disease, which is a hyperthyroid uh, disorder. And so the entire time that I was in college, I had to manage that on my own. Um, my parents lived in California or my mom did. And so being in Oregon, and needing to make sure that I stayed on top of my every five weeks, you know, getting blood drawn and then every six weeks seeing the endocrinologist to adjust my medication um, was definitely a challenge when you're juggling, you know, uh, college courses for the very first time. And on top of that, you're away from home. And on top of that, you've got a full soccer schedule. It's difficult to stay on top of such a regimented, you know, um, need. And so I was able to successfully manage that during the time that I was away. I wound up having a radioactive iodine treatment sometime in my senior year and having things resolve about a year later um, once I was done with my career. So that was certainly another obstacle. I mean, you have the obstacle of getting cut at 18. You have the obstacle of losing your coach who was like, you know, your father figure. You have the obstacle of having a medical condition um, on top of that. Uh, just having left high school, my mom had suffered a heart attack. Um, and so I had just so many things that I felt like. And then you had knee surgeries, <laughs> you know, minor ones, but they still were setbacks. So many things that I felt like uh, came in the way of trying to destroy, you know, my progress, my dreams. But um, always knowing that at the end of the day, if this was a game that I loved and wanted to pursue, that I was gonna have to work past those obstacles. Um, and at the time, of course, I had no idea what was pushing me to continue on in my journey. But looking back now, many, many years later, I realized that um, I had a mental edge on the game and on my opponents and even within my peers that allowed me to keep pushing through. And I think as I grew in the game, I realized that every obstacle that I encountered was an opportunity. When I was younger, the opportunity was to just persevere. Um, and as I've gotten older, it's been an opportunity to use, you know, my platform for many different um, causes, which we could talk about later. But, um, but continuing on with the soccer journey, um, although I had many, many obstacles throughout my career, I would say the um, greatest triumph I had was after overcoming all those obstacles. In 2005, when I finally got my call up to the full U.S. Women's National Team, um, as I was training and preparing and, you know, doing the... Um, really hard work to prove myself. Um, mind you, I was not playing a position I was comfortable in at all. I was playing left back against uh, Abby Wambach. As many of you know, she is very, very tall. I am very, very short. Uh, I'm 5'3". At the time, I was about 105. Um, and so, you know, I get called up and we go to Portugal and the greatest moment of my career happened. I know you're thinking that I started, I scored a goal. Nah. Greatest moment of my entire soccer career was coming out from the tunnel into the stadium. I look to my left and I see the very coach who told me I was not good enough to play at that level. Right there, in the flesh. 
and the look on his face when he saw me was by far the best triumph of my career. Better than any national championship, better than overcoming any obstacle was the look on his face when I came out of that tunnel. And uh, I, I'll never forget <laughs> that, that look. Um, it made everything worth it because I got to prove, not to him, but to myself, that I was good enough. That all the work that I had put in over all those years had become the very thing that I was hoping for, and that was to give myself a shot with the full team. You know, my um, journey ended pretty quickly after that game uh, and that next exit interview, which was much more professional. Um, and I realized I just wasn't sure if I was committed on the same level as everybody else to continuing to make the sacrifices that were necessary to play at that level. You know, I didn't have the same life that a lot of the other players had, and so I didn't have the flexibility to continue to keep, um, you know, leaving work at a couple days' notice for weeks at a time. You know, I had moved home to help my mom, <laughs> so I couldn't just be gone from work for weeks on end and hope to have a job when I came back. And obviously we can get into the, um, you know, social and cultural diversity issues that some players of color face, but, you know, the, um, the ultimate deciding factor for me really was that in my heart, I wasn't sure if I was committed on the same level as all the other players. And I really felt like to be at that level, you have to know with everything that you're willing to do everything and anything. And I just didn't know that. And so I felt like stepping away from the game was probably, you know, a really good idea for me to see if, as I was away from the game, if I missed it enough to want to come back. Um, and so, you know, I did work on my masters and obviously I did think that that was gonna be a career that I pursued and I did not enjoy that at all. Um, and wound up coming into coaching full time, which I've loved um, and have been committed to since. It's been 10 years um, and I've loved every minute of coaching. I've evolved, thankfully, <laughs> as a coach over the years. I think becoming a parent really helped that evolution forward. Um, but then there becomes a point in your career as a parent and former player where you start to wonder, you know, and you start to reflect on your journey as a player. And so um, the only regret I ever had in my journey was that I, I wasn't the teammate that I should have been. That although I was very athletically gifted um, and had a very successful career, I didn't command the team well. I didn't encourage people, um, and I, I don't think other other players <laughs> experienced me in a positive manner. And so that was the one regret I had coming out of the game. And so, you know, in 2019, just two years ago, I decided, you know, I, I need to make peace with that part of my game. Um, and of course, I could do it at the rec level, but that wouldn't be very Huey-like. So. I decided to come out of retirement into semi-pro um, and play with kids half my age um, and make my kids part of my journey, which was another piece that I had really regretted. I honestly believed that in order to play at that full team level, you couldn't be a mom. And so um, I needed to prove to myself that I could be a mom and a player at the same time. So I came out of retirement uh, and I had a interesting lead up as I only had two weeks to prepare for the season. Uh, my body went through a lot of adjusting as I was preparing to play at that level. Thankfully with um, the help of some athletic trainers and um, some good friends I was able to do as much as I could at the time to prepare for what was coming and I was able to start playing most of the games uh, that LA Galaxy played in. 
Um, and then we won a UWS championship. And so, you know, um, my career is obviously filled with a lot of winning. Um, and I look back at everything as a five-time Hall of Famer, two-time Division One national champion. Um, and I'm thankful and grateful for every win and every loss and every obstacle and every triumph. Um, but of course, it's taken me some time to get there. And I think uh, that's what really helped me to come to a point where I was able to blend uh, my two greatest loves, uh, psychology and then soccer into one which has been um, how Gertness was born, helping players overcome the mental portion of their game, helping people face their gaming anxiety, lack of confidence, trying to achieve a higher level. You know, um, I don't claim to be a sports psych, I'm not one, uh, but I have had great success in this sport. I've had a lot of adversity in the sport and I've had a lot of training in my career um, in, in therapy. So I've been able to combine these things together, not just based on my own experiences, but also by, you know, um, a wealth of knowledge from other, you know, professionals. Um, I've read just a ton of books and been involved with uh, Dan Abrahams, who's a world-renowned sports psych on Clubhouse and interacting with him and reading his books. Um, to then, you know, make get greatness what it is and helping players overcome the, these obstacles that they face. Uh, it could be something as small as learning how to juggle, which seems to be a big thing, you know, for um, players that I see posted very frequently in these groups that I'm in. Uh, but, you know, the mental part of your game is like Dan Abraham says, you know, in his book, if we're all cars, then the engine is, you know, your mental strength, your mental power. And so my job now has become to help players identify, you know, ways of improving their game by getting more in tuned with and strengthening um, their mental game. So hopefully my story and journey helps players know that um, there are a lot of things that will you know, interrupt your gaming flow and your dreams and all the things that you hope to achieve. But if those are things that you really, really, really are committed to achieving, you have to know and understand that um, embracing failure is part of the journey. Um, adversity is part of the journey. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's more to life than just sports. So use soccer as a um, tool to help you learn great skills for off the field and continue to strive for and reach for the stars. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're not good enough. And when they do, you make sure that you smile right in their face.